Hello and welcome to CMC Markets on Monday the 19th of December. My name is Michael Hewson and today I've asked Megan Green of Rubini Global Economics to join me for a, bit, a brief chat about the European sovereign debt crisis, obviously the events of the last 12 months, as well as what we can look forward to, hopefully or not, over the next 12 months. So, Megan, thank you very much for joining me and to have a chat with our clients about Europe and uh, the fragmented policy response that we've seen over the past 12 months. So, essentially, a common misconception about this European debt crisis is that it is front and centre a debt crisis, but it's not just a debt crisis, is it? No, it's not at all a debt crisis anymore. It started off as a public debt crisis in Greece and a private debt crisis in Spain and Ireland, a bit of both in Portugal, um, but it's moved way beyond that by now. It's, it's not only a debt crisis, it's, it's a financial crisis and a political crisis. And I think you've got you know, a banking crisis with sovereigns having to backstop all of the banks. So there's a sovereign banking negative feedback loop that we see and uh, it's impossible to break that unless you address both sides and you can't do that unless you have political unity but of course we've got a political crisis as well so it's very difficult to draw a line under this Eurozone crisis. Well we've seen that haven't we? I mean we've had numerous EU summits, we've had numerous G20 meetings, G8 meetings over the past 12, 18, 24 months and we're really no further forward than we were when we began and really the EU summit five days ago or whenever, however long ago it was was trumpeted as five days to save the euro well you know we're no nearer saving the euro now than we were then are we we're not any closer to saving the euro than we are then um, the announcements that they made at the EU summit in theory address kind of the short medium and long-term uh, nature of the crisis so in the short term they announced IMF funding um, from national central banks that could be used for a big bailout for Italy and Spain uh, in the medium term they announced that they would accelerate the ESM to next year from 2013 um, and in the long term they talked about some treaty changes but fundamentally none of these measures actually draws a line under the crisis for the IMF bazooka for Italy and Spain, um, you know, we could cobble together around 600 to 700 billion euros, and that's enough to take Italy and Spain out of the markets for about a year and a quarter, maybe a year and a half. But where's that 600 to 700 billion going to come from? So some of it will come from the IMF, um, possibly from national central banks lending to the IMF. Um, some of it will come from the EFSF. There's 250 billion left over that hasn't been earmarked. And some of it will probably come from the ECB in terms of its continued securities markets program purchasing. So using those different sources, you could cobble together around 600 to 700 billion euros. But that would be stretching it. It would be stretching it, and what's more, it wouldn't actually really help. It would just kind of delay the inevitable. So Spain and Italy both have new governments that have come in, and immediately they have to implement austerity measures, and they also have to implement structural reforms. And in the short term, the austerity measures will just undermine growth. In the medium to long term, the structural reforms will help, but it will take a number of years for them to bite and start supporting growth. And so by mid-2013, at the latest, when Spain and Italy have to return to the markets, their debt dynamics are going to look even worse because their GDP will have fallen by then. So uh, when they have to return to the markets, I don't think investors will be any more willing to hold their debt than they are now. So I think a debt restructuring is probably inevitable for both countries, but they've managed to do what they do best, which is to kick the can a bit further down the road. Well, we've seen, I think we've seen that this, um, this morning in the past couple of days, actually, with Greece and also with Ireland. Um, we had Irish GDP contract by 1.9% for Q3 at the end of last week and obviously that is a concern because Ireland up till Q3 was actually growing albeit very very modestly but it was growing. Um, obviously Greece as well there's a possibility they could contract by 6% next year and they're talking about further austerity there. I mean how, how much austerity can EU leaders expect to squeeze out of Greece before there's no more juice left? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's hard to say where the tipping point is, whereby, you know, either the Troika says you, you've missed your targets so many times, we're not willing to lend more money to you, Greece, or whether it's the Greek government or the Greek people saying we can't do this anymore. I think ultimately, uh, EU leaders have said that Greece is a special case. I think really it's going to be a model for how we deal with weaker countries in the Eurozone. And ultimately, the Greek government will face the choice uh, in terms of its growth strategy. It can either continue down this road of of austerity and recession slash depression um, to regain competitiveness and that will take about a decade for Greece probably um, and finally return to growth 
or it can choose to leave the Eurozone, uh, reissue the drachma, see it depreciate massively, regain competitiveness, and return to growth. And that's not to say that leaving the Eurozone is an easy choice, it will be messy and painful, but if you look at kind of the nuclear case of Argentina, that's the worst case scenario, when Argentina defaulted and gave up the peg to the US dollar, it returned to growth within months. So it's a much faster route to growth, and I think given that choice, most weaker Eurozone governments will probably choose to leave the Eurozone. I think, I think you're right. And um, how does the fiscal compact fit in to that scenario? Because we've heard a lot of rhetoric from Angela Merkel in particular that she's determined to screw down um, budgets for all these European countries. And the fiscal compact was basically trumpeted as you know, one of the big um, takeaways from the EU summit. But essentially all that's doing is just re-initiating the um, stability, and growth um, stability and Growth Pact from Maastricht in 1992. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, the idea of the fiscal compact is it's meant to be the first steps towards an eventual fiscal union. And I think fiscal union and eurobonds are potentially the only game changer left in this crisis. Uh, and these are supposed to be the first steps, but they're not actually fiscal union whatsoever. All that the fiscal compact really does is institutionalize the asymmetric adjustment that's going on in the Eurozone, whereby it's the peripheral countries that are having to make all of the adjustment with retrenchment, while the core countries don't make any adjustment at all. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Germany's been really insistent that uh, fiscal union happen a certain way, that there's political union first and then pooling of assets and finally pooling of liabilities with eurobonds. And I think that's probably really the right way to go about it. But they needed to have started that process about 20 years ago. And now we're in the middle of a crisis. They need to do things differently. Unfortunately, I think that's sort of beyond the realms of their ability to do so. I mean, we've heard a lot about the role of the European Central Bank. And we've heard an awful, awful lot about eurobonds as if they're some sort of silver bullet to the crisis. Now Draghi at the weekend in the FT talked about or completely implicitly ruled out the European Central Bank getting in and backstopping sovereigns. At the moment what they're doing is they're creating liquidity for the banks with these three-year LTROs. And there has been some talk about that the banks will basically borrow money from the ECB and then buy even more Italian and Spanish bonds in an attempt to drive bond yields down, but that doesn't deal with the problem, does it? It doesn't deal with the problem at all. In fact, it just exacerbates it. I mean, that's a terrifying prospect in my view because then you're just strengthening this banking sovereign debt feedback loop if you have banks um, you know, borrowing at the ECB to buy more sovereign debt. Um, that just makes things worse. Um, so at, up, ex exactly, and at the end of the day, if you see cascading defaults, it will be that much messier. Um, I'm not convinced that banks will actually do that. I've spoken to a lot of banks, and uh, it seems that actually they're not interested in the same sort of carry trade that they previously carried out using cheap ECB financing for sovereign debt. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily going to come about, but uh, if it does, it's a terrifying prospect. So I think, it's, I think it's unlikely that the ECB will step in and act as lender of last resort for sovereigns. What does that mean going forward? More uncertainty, more kicking the can down the road? Yeah, I think we'll continue to lurch from mini crisis to mini crisis in this greater crisis. I think, unfortunately, um, fiscal union, is, as I said, is the only game changer, and I don't think that there's the political will uh, to achieve that. I mean, for there to be true fiscal union, Germany would have to accept unlimited fiscal transfers to the weaker countries forever. And I don't think that the Ger German government or the German people will ever be willing to accept that. So so I think fundamentally it will come down to a question of growth and growth is the one thing that no one has done anything to deal with. Uh, and it's not happening at the moment is it? The EU is sliding back into recession and yeah. at the moment the debt is getting bigger or will get bigger if they don't have any growth in the European Union and that's something that Angela Merkel seems to have a bit of a blind spot for. But I think she's also constrained by the fact that the German Constitutional Court has tied our hands behind her back, as we saw earlier this year. They will, what, would, what would be required, I think, out of Germany would be constitutional change. And I think you're absolutely right. There's no appetite in Germany to act as a lender of last resort, not only for the sovereigns, but also euro bonds. And historically, they've never really shown any inclination to help out um, other EU nations. If you go back to 1992, and when 
the UK and Italy dropped out of the exchange rate mechanism. Germany was asked to drop their interest rates to try and make or try and take the pressure off the UK and they refused. So I think there's a lot of commentators out there saying that eventually the ECB will do the right thing. Are you convinced that they will? Not at all. I think for the ECB to, to do the right thing, quote unquote, it would have to step in in an unlimited, unsterilized fashion forever. If it did anything short of that, if it stepped in in a limited way, it would basically create the equivalent of a, a bank run in the bond markets. All of a sudden, these investors who have been trying to get rid of this debt um, will see that there's finally a big buyer and will line up to dump what they're holding. So I think the ECB could actually exacerbate things um, if it stepped in in a, in a limited way and I don't think that there's really any chance the ECB will step in in an unlimited way. So we're faced with a binary solution then aren't we? We're faced with full fiscal union and all the political obstacles to that or a breakup of the euro. So we've heard a lot of doomsday scenarios regarding the possibility of one or more countries dropping out of the euro. What do you think will be the consequences of one country or more countries leaving the eurozone? Firstly on the country leaving it but also on the countries left behind. Yeah, I mean, I think the first country that will leave the Eurozone is Greece, possibly as early as the end of next year, when it will still be running a primary deficit. So I think that basically it will be like a divorce. Um, the Troika and Greece will admit this really wasn't meant to be. Um, and I think that because Greece is running a primary deficit and will be frozen out of the markets if it leaves the Eurozone, the Troika will provide some kind of bridge financing to facilitate Greece's exit from the Eurozone. So I think that there's a chance that it could be done in a negotiated orderly way. Like a Marshall Plan for Greece? That's right, exactly. And, and I think there are a lot of triggers that could switch it from orderly to disorderly, certainly. Events could supersede um, best intentions. It's possible, but I think it's in everybody's best interest to have um, a default and exit be as orderly as possible. So I think um, they'll probably uh, deal with it that way. And then, as I mentioned before, I think Greece will become kind of a model for the weaker countries. So I think Portugal won't be very far behind. I think probably Ireland will end up going down the same route. Even if it doesn't have to, I think it might choose to. If, if nobody else is making their creditors whole, then why would Ireland? And I think Italy and Spain, which are really the big question, will ultimately face the same decision. And, and I think it will be much more difficult to make an exit of Italy and Spain be orderly, but I think that they'll definitely try. Um, but once you have Italy and Spain leaving the Eurozone, there's essentially no Eurozone left. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, monetary union is really a political choice. So if you have that many countries dropping out, I don't think there will be the political will to keep this Euro project running any longer. Oh, there could be the political will because it's one of, the, I think it's been one of those things that's been running for about 50, 60 years, but will the people want it? And I think while the politicians may want it, I, don't th I think we're finding that austerity fatigue within local populations, sick and tired of bailing out banks, um, there will need to be capital restructurings. Also the fact that Next year, sovereigns and banks will need to raise 2.9 trillion euros. So, absolutely, I think you're right. Greece could be the first country to drop out, but I'm, I'm thinking that it may be, may be before the end of next year, perhaps, given how much money needs to be raised over the next 12 months or before the next 12 months. Yeah, I think probably the timing of a Greece exit depends in part on how well the other banks in the Eurozone have been ring-fenced. Um, I think the Troika are keeping Greece on life support until they can feel confident that they can cut Greece off um, and it won't cause a global, a, you know, a financial crisis throughout the region, if not the globe. Um, so maybe in the middle of next year they'll, they'll have to meet their new tier one capital ratio requirements um, and, and it's possible that after that happens the Troika will decide look, um, you know, it, we're free to cut Greece off now. That's, that's not helping though, is it? The raising of these tier one capital ratios, that's ex actually exacerbating the recession in Europe because essentially what's happening is that banks are either having to sell off assets or cut back on lending. And at a point where growth is starting to contract, you really need banks to continue to lend for businesses to grow. So they're in a bit of a but if they're in a bit of a bind essentially, aren't they? Yeah. You know, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. And then of course you've got the small matter of the ratings agencies, you know, and, and France is AAA rating and we've talked, I think we've talked about that a lot online, on Twitter and what have you. And the fact that if France loses its AAA rating, which seems to me inevitable, 
what does that do to the funding capabilities not only to the EFSF but also to the ESM which is due to come online in the middle of next year. It's not going to make it any easier is it? It's actually going to make it more expensive. That's right. It will just make loans from these facilities more expensive for the borrower countries um, and so you're adding more expensive debt to debt that they're already holding. Um, it all just serves to buy more time. Um, but eventually, especially with growth uh, elusive over the next few years, um, I think that countries will decide there's a faster route towards growth um, if, if they get to regain control over their monetary policy. I should say there are a few things that could happen that could actually generate some growth in the Eurozone um, over the next year. Um, to take the optimistic scenario, yeah, there's a absolutely. laundry list. I think, we need, I think we need to take an optimistic scenario because I don't think we want our clients to start throwing themselves off buildings. So let's try and draw an optimistic scenario, shall yeah, we? Yeah, sure. There's a laundry list of things that need to happen for this recession to bottom out next year um, and growth to return. Uh, the ECB needs to cut rates really aggressively to close to zero. <clears throat> it needs to provide uh, quantitative and credit easing. Uh, it needs to talk down the euro massively so that it depreciates to parity with the US dollar. Um, and the, the core countries need to provide fiscal stimulus for the peripheral countries. Uh, the probability of each one of these ha things happening is pretty low. And I'll give you, you know, two main examples. Um, in terms of the euro depreciating massively, I don't think that the US or China would allow that, actually. Everybody now is trying to have a weak currency. And so um, I don't think it's possible for that to happen. Also, you you look as, as things get better in the eurozone, then the euro appreciates as things get bad, it depreciates. It's impossible to engineer it so that things are getting better while the euro depreciates. Um, and in terms of uh, fiscal stimulus from the core, I recently attended a conference with a bunch of German CDU MPs and they had an entire panel session on uh, austerity in Germany. And I finally asked, why are we talking about austerity? Why aren't we talking about a stimulus package? Um, and they looked at me like I had 20 heads. Uh, it's just absolutely not on the table whatsoever. But that's completely out of their psyche. It's out of their mindset. It basically, I think that dates back to the 1930s and hyperinflation. And they perceive that stimulus you know, promotes inflation. And that is why they were reluctant in 1992 to help the UK and Italy in the exchange rate mechanism and that's why I think it's very unlikely that the ECB will step in and bail out the sovereigns um, going forward. I just don't think it's in their mindset and I think Anglo-Saxon um, economies I don't think have really understood that mindset or mentality and I think they're underestimating the ability or overestimating the ability that the ECB will have to intervene in the crisis. Yeah, absolutely. If you walk into the Bundesbank, there's a trillion Reichsmark note that's framed in the lobby. I mean, it's a social memory at this point, but I think it's a very powerful one. But also there's a question of wage growth in Germany, which if you look um, over the past decade, real wages really haven't risen in Germany. It's been really flat where they've risen quite significantly in almost every other Eurozone country. And so if Germany were to um, all of a sudden be in favor of the ECB stepping in as a lender of last resort, it, the government would have to admit to its population, look, you, you went through flat uh, real wages for a decade and it was really all for nothing. But I think why they did that was because obviously they, there was German reunification. So they had to make the eastern part of Germany a lot more competitive. And that was the price worth paying because essentially it was bringing back two separate parts of Germany that have been separated for you know 40 or 50 years and it's easy to make that argument because you have a common bond with your sort of East German neighbours if you like. I think it's a lot harder case to make when you've got a European sort of continent that's generally over the past three four hundred years been at war with each other and you've got to get over that distrust and you've got to put that distrust to one side and say well actually you know, you've got to basically continue another 30 or 40 years of austerity or very low wage growth so that your southern competitors can basically rebalance and restructure their economies and there's no evidence whatsoever that they want to be able to do that. That's absolutely right. I don't think that there's really the political will for everyone to do that. Uh, and now would be a crucial time for there to be political will and political union. Um, so you see these EU summits, um, every announcement is always disappointing. I think we're seeing sort of a, a race to the bottom in terms of the common denominator. You have all of these different governments having to answer not only to the EU, but also to their electorates. And so what they announce is, is the best that they could 
could come up with really, but it's, it has not so far been good enough. And that's essentially the dichotomy at the moment, or the problem that faces EU leaders. They've got one eye on trying to keep a consensus within the room at the EU summit, and they've got another eye on their populations back home, as seen by David Cameron's veto um, at the weekend, which caused him all manner of problems in Europe, but which was hailed from the rafters in the UK. And I think, you know, that's the same with Merkel and her attitude towards um, Europe and Sarkozy as well. Okay, well, thanks very much for coming in, and um, hopefully we'll be able to have a lot more of these chats. Um, that pretty much wraps up this little chat with Megan from Rubini Global Economics. Thanks very much for listening, and um, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. <laughs>